Well, hi everyone. I'm gonna stand because that just seems more comfortable up here for me. Um, I'm very excited to be here today, especially against this um, beautiful backdrop of this incredible exhibit. Um, so my story about Harlem and my social justice um, journey here, I think is a little different from um, some of the other folks that you're hearing today because I didn't grow up in Harlem. I don't have roots here. Um, I lived here for a few years. Um, after I moved to New York, and I'm very lucky to now work here, so I'm, I'm glad I get to commute from Brooklyn back to Harlem and spend time here. Um, but I have a fairly different experience of Harlem. Um, I actually am a first-generation immigrant um, of Bengali heritage. I immigrated to the U.S. in 2002, um, right after 9-11, so early 2002. Um, and I immigrated to the Midwest, and um, you might imagine what the racist backlash was back then. Um, I sort of landed in the middle of all of that in a pretty rural, um, exclusively white Midwestern small town and spent a lot of time there in high school trying very hard to assimilate, trying very hard to negotiate the racist backlash, learning very quickly that this country is uh, not a great place for women of color. Um, so that's where I was. I went to New Mexico, and then when I actually moved to New York, I came to uh, work at Race Forward and Color Lines to actually engage in immigrant rights work and racial justice work, and um, originally went to the Upper West Side because you know how it is. Some lady had a friend, had a friend who was subleasing their small bedroom for like $300, and I was like, hook me up, and then I, there, there I was. Um, and the short version of what happened there is uh, the Upper West Side was a very uncomfortable neighborhood for me, class-wise, race-wise. I got kicked out, essentially evicted, um, right as Hurricane Irene was happening. Um, so the day the hurricane was coming, I found all of my stuff out on the street. Um, and I somehow, after all of that, landed in Harlem and got a, a little apartment up at 151st in Macomb's place. And the first couple of months of living in Harlem, I was walking around jubilant. I was like, this is great. I feel really wonderful here. I feel welcome. I feel happy. Um, I feel safe and comfortable. And then I had this realization that for the first time in my adult life, since I was a teenager, I got to Harlem and I didn't feel like I had to code switch so heavily because it's a neighborhood in a community predominantly of color. And I didn't feel like I had to perform my identity as an immigrant, as a first generation immigrant, in such an um, aggressive way. So it, it just felt like I had this eight year long migraine that was you know, triggered by white supremacy and assimilationist tendencies. And then I got to Harlem and I was like, I feel great. It's like somebody gave me all the Tylenol. Um, so that felt really, you know, wonderful. I started to sort of negotiate my uh, my space and my relationships in Harlem more. Got to know more folks living here, made more friends, spent a lot of time um, at the laundry, uh, the laundromat actually on 133rd Street um, and Frederick Douglass, where um, I did most of my grad school reading. I'll have to credit that space with finishing most of my classes. Spent a lot of time um, at Devon's Fish and Chips, which I am so sad to hear has closed. Oh, oh, okay, great, it's reopening. Great. Um, you know, St. Nicholas Park, um, the amphitheater at um, Jackie Robinson Park, um, Harlem YMCA, which if those of you that go to the Harlem Y, I would highly recommend walking, going to work out and then walking directly across the street to IHOP and then eating a, a full stack and then walking directly across the street and going to Popeyes and eating french fries. Um, that was my workout routine. It works pretty well. Um, so, you know, I was, I was really coming into Harlem as a first generation immigrant, realizing for the first time that even though I was here in New York to do racial justice work, that it had taken me a very long time to find a community where I could feel welcome and where I could feel integrated enough. Um, so while those were happy occurrences for me, and I feel like I was growing positively um, in doing that, um, there were also a lot of difficult things happening, and I credit Harlem with having taught me a lot, a lot, a lot about how to grow politically, how to grow personally and emotionally, and how to really 
create a formative political analysis, but particularly around anti-blackness, and particularly around anti-blackness and immigrant communities that are of Asian descent and in Asian American communities. So I'll just share a couple of things that happened in the, the couple of years that I lived here. One is that as soon as I decided to move to Harlem, intimate relationships in my family started really turning pretty um, conflict-ridden. So you can say that the internalized anti-blackness and internalized racism of my family members really started blazing in full force. Um, uh, my mom had a big fight with me about moving to Harlem because she couldn't understand why I would move to quote unquote such a drug infested dangerous place and I was like I can't understand how you could be so racist and you know the racial coding in that. Um, there was this, this moment where uh, my partner who is a, is a tall black man, we were traveling in the subway one day together and we would do the commute, you know, the uh, long distance uh, relationship commute between Brooklyn and Harlem. <laughs> um, and he made a, a, a comment one time, and this is when I had been living in Harlem for a while, something about how the undercover cops on the train were so obvious. And it was like, well, it's 80 degrees, why are they wearing like all the long sleeve shirts and the vests and the sweater and then everything to cover up the gun holster right over there. And I had this realization that a, I had never noticed the undercover cops in my neighborhood, even though they're everywhere. At this time, I was living on 132nd and St. Nicholas, right across the, the street from the park. Um, and just this like understanding that, wow, my racial privilege in this scenario is so significant that I've lived now two years in Harlem and not seen the undercover cops, but of course, every time he moves anywhere in the world, he has to see them because that's the degree of vigilance that it requires to survive, right? Not particularly as a black male um, in, in Harlem. So I was, I was really encountering a lot of those scenarios. There was this one time when um, I went to visit some relatives in Long Island for Durga Puja, which is a really super big um, uh, Hindu festival. It's in worship of uh, the goddess Durga. It happens on October every year and my uncle was driving me back from Long Island to uh, my home. And he realized that I lived in Harlem and would not drop me to my apartment, which was at that point on 151st in McCombs. He literally do drove me to East 86th and dropped me off there because it would, was a more appropriate neighborhood for a young woman like me to be living in. Um, you know, and so all of the emotions that I had around indignation, anger, despair, sorrow, what I found was that a lot of that was coming into focus around relationships that I actually valued very highly. Um, cousins, my mom, my grandmom, um, aunts and uncles, um, you know, things like that. So uh, it, it felt like a moment of um, responsibility and accountability that I was having to go through these difficult transformational processes with people that I cared about. Um, my, one of my favorite uh, examples actually is my uh, grandmother, who by all accounts is quite racist, um, comes to visit from India every year, um, and she loves to go about New York, and you know, when I was living in Harlem, of course she came to stay with me. She was horrified. Um, at this point, I was also going through my own political journey around gentrification and displacement and tenant rights in Harlem, because I had uh, the little apartment that I had on 151st was its own little disaster zone. Everything was happening, cracking, crumbling, peeling, rotting, things were falling apart. You'd be calling the management company, they're like, we don't know, we don't know. There was one moment where there was like half the ceiling in the bathroom was gone and so you'd like go to take a shower and be like, I hope no one's upstairs today because <laughs> half the ceiling's gone, that kind of thing. So my grandma came to visit amidst all of this. Uh, you can imagine that it you know, reinforced a lot of her own um, internalized things around blackness, around poverty, around her own racism. Um, but I took her to see this incredible exhibit at the Schomburg that was called, I think, Africans in India or Blacks in India. And uh, it was curated by Sylvia and Diouf. This was several years ago. And it was fantastic. There were these beautiful paintings and images of the historical legacy of Africanist people in India. And it was, I think the exhibit was called From 
African, Africans in India from slaves to generals and politicians. And it was the story of how in the early 1300s to the mid um, you know, 1800s, um, the African diaspora essentially moved to India and became fully integrated and held enormous positions of power um, in government, in the military, and so on. So she had, my grandmother had this realization that, oh my God, some of our ancestors could actually be from Africa and she couldn't handle it. It was a little too much. Um, so that was you know, another difficult situation to negotiate. Um, I also came across, much later, came across this beautiful book by Vivek Bald called Bengali Harlem, uh, which some of you might have heard about. It's uh, an incredible historical uncovering of the the story of Bangladeshi and Bengali men, traders, peddlers, vendors that came in the 1800s. They jumped aboard um, merchant navy ships, um, uh, mo mostly European ships, and they came to the US. And in order to integrate, they moved all over. But one of the places they settled in was Harlem, um, You know, particularly around integration did important things like build solidarity, build community, make sure that they were showing up for um, community needs altogether, also marrying into Puerto Rican and African American families. So there's a really incredible history of um, South Asian, Bengali, and African American solidarity that is completely hidden. I would have never even known about this, first of all, if I hadn't stumbled across the book. Um, and I, I think that all of those moments combined, you know, really cumulatively produced for me a lot of transformation and change in my own political journey. One is that it taught me that it's really important to not, in social movements, it's really important to not um, think only about cultural purity and racial purity in such discrete terms, but also to not think that, oh, like, well, we're all the same and we're all eventually mixed anyways, so that's not really true. What I learned in Harlem is that black bodies are policed so aggressively that gentrification and displacement happen so aggressively that as Asian immigrants and as Asian Americans, it's completely not okay to have a racial justice mov movement that does not centralize the interruption of anti-blackness. So that's something that I feel, as a racial justice educator, um, I had analysis around but didn't have emotion and experience around and I was able to get that from the time I spent here in Harlem and I continue to spend here in Harlem. Um, so that really has informed my practice. Another thing that I've learned from my time here that I value a lot is um, the understanding that it's really important to uncover history of solidarity which often gets um, erased and uh, deliberately so and I think it's it, it, it's important to have that because it makes us feel more connected and also because it strengthens our movements. Um, and I guess the one thing I just wanted to share in terms of closing this out really is, um, I think that the reason I feel so positively about my time here and um, why I feel it's influenced me so deeply and so emotionally as an activist is because I was able to experience difficult moments of transformation around personal relationships, intimate familial relationships, particularly around anti-blackness in Asian communities, because I was also experiencing so much joy living here. I was happy, you know? Everything I was hearing from my aunt and my mom and my grandmom was actually very contradictory to the joy that I was feeling living in the neighborhood and the amount of community resilience and strength and integration I was seeing. Um, and I take that lesson um, very, very much to heart that I don't think we should build social justice movements that only lift up um, trauma upon trauma and forget to do the celebration and forget to do the, the work to integrate joy because I don't, I think often in our movements we can shove political analysis down people's throats and then expect that they will transform. But actually you have to have a movement that will support transformation and difficulty and challenge and also personal growth through joy and through love and through support. Um, and I felt like I have had that and so much more here. Um, so it's really a pleasure um, to continue to come up here from Brooklyn make the daily hour long commute each way two ways two hours thank you i ain't got it smooth i ain't trying to be rude i'm just trying to see you move your body with someone so clap with me so clap with me i ain't got it smooth i ain't trying to be rude i'm just trying to see you move your body with someone so clap with me so clap with me
I ain't got it smooth. I ain't trying to be rude. I'm just trying to see you move your body with someone. So clap with me. Let the kids hit. Let the drum drum. F your sickness. F the humdrum.